Well, good afternoon. I'm Abby Wolf, the Executive Director of the Hutchin Center for African and African American Research. And on behalf of Professor Henry Louis Gates Jr., who is diagonal beneath me right now, and all of us at the Hutchin Center, it's a pleasure to welcome you to this virtual space for Greg Downs' virtual, Du Bois virtual lecture this afternoon. One brief housekeeping item. Please write your questions in the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen. We ask that you keep them brief so that we can incorporate as many as possible. Questions will be read to Professor Downs by me and may be edited for clarity and length during the Q&A. Now it's my pleasure to say a few words about Alejandro de la Fuente, who will introduce Professor Downs' lecture this afternoon. Alejandro de la Fuente is Robert Woods Bliss Professor of Latin American History and Economics, Professor of African and African American Studies and of History, direct, um, and very importantly for us, Director of the Afro-Latin American Research Institute at the Hutchins Center, and this is all at Harvard. Um, a historian of Latin America and the Caribbean who specializes in the study of comparative slavery and race relations, Professor De La Fuente's works on race, slavery, law, art, and Atlantic history have been published in Spanish, English, Portuguese, Italian, German, and French. He is the author of Becoming Free, Becoming Black, Race, Freedom, and Law in Cuba, Virginia, and Louisiana, co-authored with Ariella J. Gross. Havana and the Atlantic in the 16th century, and a nation for all, race, inequality, and politics in 20th century Cuba, which was the winner of the Southern Historical Association's 2003 prize for best book in Latin American history. He's the co-editor with George Reed Andrews of Afro, of Afro Latin American Studies, an introduction, and of the Afro Latin America book series from Cambridge University Press. He is also the curator of three art exhibits dealing with issues of race, all of which have been featured at the Hutchins Center, and the author or editor of their corresponding volumes, Queloides, Race and Racism in Cuban Contemporary Art, Drapetomania, Grupo Antillano, and the Art of Afro-Cuba, and Diago, the Past of this Afro-Cuban Present. Professor De La Fuente, as I mentioned, is the founding director of the Afro-Latin American Research Institute at the Hutchins Center and the faculty chair of the Cuba Studies at the David Rockefeller Center for Latin American Studies. He is also the senior editor of the journal Cuban Studies and served for five years as the editor of Transition Magazine, also at the Hutchins Center. And without further ado, please join me in welcoming Alejandro De La Fuente to the WEB Du Bois Virtual Lecture Series this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you, Abby. Thank you so much, Abby. And thank you, Skip, for the invitation uh, to join today, to be home um, uh, today to introduce uh, our Du Bois uh, uh, Lecture Series presenter, which is Professor uh, Gregory Downs. Uh, Greg Downs is professor of history at the University of California, Davis, UC Davis, and is a prolific historian and a public intellectual who has produced very important scholarship on the American Civil War, on slave emancipation in the United States, and on Reconstruction. Uh, most recently, with um, uh, I'm going to show my own bias here with a much welcome, uh, with a much welcome uh, touch, transnational touch and attention uh, to Cuba, which I think all historians uh, of U.S. slavery should do. <laughs> um, he is the author of the Second American Revolution, the Civil War Era Struggle over Cuba, and the Rebirth of the American Republic, which was published very recently by University of North Carolina Press also of After Apotamax, Military Occupation and the Ends of War, published by Harvard 2015, and Declarations of Dependence, The Long Reconstruction of Popular Politics in the U.S. South, which was published by UNC as well in 2011. And he is uh, also the author of an interactive digital history of the U.S. Army uh, occupation of the South, Mapping Occupation, which I invite you all to uh, take a look at because it's really interesting and, and, and can, can serve as an inspiration to many projects that are related to our work in different ways. He's also the co-editor with Kate Masur from uh, Northwestern of The World uh, the Civil War Made, uh, published by UNC in 2015. 
Uh, now, I mentioned that Professor uh, Downs is also a public historian, a public uh, intellectual. In 2018, he was elected to the Society of American Historians, and he received the UC Davis Distinguished Scholarly Public Service Award uh, for his contributions. These awards acknowledge his contributions as a public historian, you know, in addition to his scholarship and uh, another side of his scholarship. Professor Downs co-wrote the National Park Service theme study on reconstruction created in January 2017 by then President Barack Obama and helped edit the Park Service uh, Services Handbook on reconstruction efforts that have been highlighted in the Atlantic and the, uh, and the New York Times. I understand that today Professor Downs will be presenting some of his most recent research uh, on the transnational dimensions of the U.S. Civil War, abolitionism, and its connections with political and social, social conflicts uh, in Cuba. The title of the lecture is uh, Emancipation, Empire, and Expansion, Cuba's Crisis and U.S. Anti-Slavery, 1848-1878. Let me finish by saying, Greg, that I very much hope you do get to visit uh, in the near future because after this lecture, we would have taken you to dinner and we, and then the conversation would have continued there. And I very much look forward to having that opportunity uh, in person, which is the way it should be. Welcome. Thank you so much. I wanna thank you for that generous uh, introduction. Uh, I should also make sure to note, uh, you know, that I was pleased to uh, be a small part of helping uh, with Professor Gates' reconstruction of uh, PBS documentary with a number of other wonderful historians, uh, which was, uh, you know, a highlight. And I want to thank you all for the invitation. I want to thank uh, Matt and Abby and everyone for their work in helping to set this up. And I uh, want to thank, uh, thank you all for having me. Of course, I too wish I were there in person, though I confess with the sun streaming in the window, I'm not sure that I, I would have wanted to be there in person from California in late November. Um, but I would have, uh, but I'll, I would miss the uh, opportunity for follow up conversation. But I'll hope to be able to have a chance for some of that and the questions and answer the questions uh, that will follow this talk. <clears throat> so thank you so much. In April 1865, oh, first let me start my, uh, start my PowerPoint. There we go. In April 1865, Chaplain Garland White marched with the 28th United States Colored Infantry through the just surrendered Confederate capital of Richmond. As a vast multitude assembled on Broad Street, Garland White proclaimed their freedom, after which the doors of all the slave pens were thrown open and thousands came out shouting and praising God. Overcome with tears, White retired. But later that day, his regiment brought to him a woman who wanted to meet him. This woman quizzed him about his birthplace and about his most recent master, Confederate politician Robert Toombs. And then the woman said, this is your mother, Garland, whom you are now talking to, who has spent 20 years of grief about her son. Writing to the Christian recorder, Wright finished this part of the story with, I cannot express the joy I felt. White's story is an extraordinarily dramatic one, even for a dramatic era. He had fled DC in 1859, and established himself in the British Empire in Canada as an AME pastor. But in 1862, watching the Civil War, he lobbied his DC acquaintance, William Seward, for a position in the US Army, then recruited black troops to serve what he called my people and my country. Understandably, scholars who utilize this letter, like Chris Hagar, Edward Miller Jr., and others, emphasize White's dramatic reunion with his mother. But White added an interesting twist at the letter's end. Turning back to his fellow soldiers, White wrote to the Christian recorder, I was with them and am still with them and am willing to stay with them until freedom is proclaimed throughout the world. Yes, we will follow this race of men in search of liberty through the whole island of Cuba. For us, White's abrupt shift from Confederacy to Cuba might seem a jarring one. Henrico County, 
a long way from Havana. And White did not explain that reference to Cuba for our benefit. He expected his readers to understand it. And that expectation gives us a window into the broad international vision of 19th century abolitionists. For many of them, almost certainly grasp the connection immediately. Abolitionists like White saw slavery as a hemispheric phenomenon, anti-slavery and international project. In the 1840s and 1850s, many had hoped that destroying slavery in Cuba and Brazil would undermine slavery inside the United States. But then in the 1860s, that order flipped. Now that slavery inside the United States was ending, in front of White's own eyes, in part by his own words. And so White and others reversed the course of their internationalism. They asked, would the destruction of slavery in the United States destroy slavery in the rest of the hemisphere? Could the emancipations in Manassas engender the emancipation of Matanzas? A terrific literature guides us toward this abolitionist and black internationalism. The work of my colleague, Justin Leroy, Brandon Bird, Caleb McDaniel, Adam Rothman, especially Gerald Horn, an older work by John Etta Cole, Lisa Brock, and many others. But still we might ask, what kind of internationalism are we talking about and what forms did it take? Whereas we imagine Garland White's perspective, imagine voyage to Cuba, we must take account of his black skin and of his abolitionist ideology, but we might also pause on the uniforms that Garland White and the 28th USCI soldiers would have worn. Men with black skins, yes, but also blue uniforms, the uniforms of the US Army. This image might make us pause. For the idea of blue clad US Army soldiers marching through Havana was familiar to many 19th century observers, but for an entirely different reason. It was an image common to filibustering and expansionism, to narratives of American empire. US writers frequently dreamt of marching through Havana, drawing the United States into the Gulf by direct military intervention, or private filibusters analyzed by Amy Greenberg, Robert May, Matthew Pragvatero, Greg Lightfoot, others. But these two images of black internationalism and filibustering are hard to reconcile. Usually we portray filibusters as tools of slavery, not of abolition. So Garland White's image draws us to emancipation, but also to empire. While jarring, this juxtaposition squares with some recent work that has broadened our understanding of filibustering, including Rodrigo Lazo's study of Cuban writers' celebration of filibusterism, and Michelle Gobat's portrayal of filibuster William Walker as liberal imperialist. Gobat's notion of liberal imperialism is extremely familiar to studies of British and other empires, but challenging for some US narratives of this period, the Thai empire to slavery and reaction. But it is not, if challenging, it is not a presentist reading of the past. For Spanish officials, feared exactly this liberal imperialism in the mid 19th century. Spanish rule over Cuba had survived the assaults of pro-slavery imperialism, but diplomats worried openly that their hold over the island could not survive the threat of anti-slavery expansionism hinted at in Garland White's letter. The alliance they feared of filibusteros and abolitionistas. So my talk puts black internationalism into blue uniforms. Abolitionist dreams into filibuster methods to ask how Civil War era African-Americans imagined Cuba and also how they imagined the United States in that process. For Garland White and other emancipatory internationalists grappled with a promising perilous question, should they grab hold of US power or escape it? And if they could grab hold of the US, what should they do with it? I've laid a lot on the table. And before diving back into the story of Cuba, I wanna step back here and explain what I'm saying about their views of slavery and power 
because these can be fraught topics easily misunderstood. Garland White knew well the power of enslaved people to claim their freedom. He did it himself. He also knew the limits of the army, which he wrote about frequently. So he had no illusions that US soldiers in Richmond or in Havana would give freedom to passive enslaved people. He knew that wasn't the case. But then why did he need, feel the need for soldiers in Richmond and in Havana at all? Why not simply call for a Cuban revolt and wait for it to happen? The answer is, in my view, that white and other abolitionists understood the enduring power of slavery and the need for counterweight in governance and the lack of options of governance beyond the US Army in many parts of the US South. Frederick Douglass had wrestled with slavery's power in an 1869 speech to the American Anti-Slavery Society, where he said, slavery is not honestly dead. There can be no such thing as the immediate, unconditional, complete abolition of slavery anywhere in the world. An instant may snap the chain, but a century is not too much to obliterate the traces of a former bondage. Garland White, like Douglas, like Henry McNeil Turner, I'll come to, saw the strength of slavery and the stubborn refusal of planters to acknowledge its end. They saw its strength and the need to station US troops in most county seats in the years after surrender. They expected slavery to be just as resilient in Cuba. Soldiers had to teach the masters about freedom and the meaning of freedom. They didn't need to teach the enslaved people. In this way, US emancipation had forced a reckoning within abolitionism and anti-slavery with the role of government, with the relationship between force and freedom. That relationship had troubled abolitionist societies, which early on it included anarchists, celebrants of democratic popular will, who suggested that slavery was weak, that it would collapse when government withdrew an appealing story for those who worried about the tyranny of the state. But wartime reminded abolitionists of the tyranny the state had to combat, the tyranny of the masters. Enslaved people fought in every possible way and still slavery was not safely dead. So now what? Douglas struggled with that same question in that same 1869 speech that I just quoted. At first, saying the answer was the government should let him alone and give him fair play. But then on reflection, reversing his statement, reversing the order. First, give him fair play by ensuring, which meant enforcing equal opportunity, then and only then, let him alone. And Douglas's reversal echoed the claims of freed people across the South during the Civil War and Reconstruction, who called for what they called practical freedom, defended a freedom defended by proximate force, not just by law or proclamation. So no wonder that black abolitionists like white expected emancipation in Cuba to require similar force. And no wonder that Douglas concluded that same 1869 speech about slavery and governance by calling on President Grant to intervene forcefully to aid those heroic and noble Cubans. Heroic and noble people needed governmental help, not but because they were weak, but because slavery was strong. More broadly, Douglas's multi-sided speech and White's story of flight to Canada, return to the US Army and dream of international emancipation combine two analytic questions I've been following over my career. One asks how freed people and other 19th century Americans reckoned with the government's role in their lives, especially in the aftermath of the Civil War. I examined popular claims on the state by black and white Southerners in my first book, Declarations of Dependence. Then I analyzed the surprisingly extensive reconstruction occupation of 750 outposts in the Confederacy and a free people's utilization and demand for that proximate power. In my second book, After Appomattox, and most recently I followed that explicit statism that led some black and white Republicans to seek to create a second American Republic, not to salvage the first. In my other analytic line, 
I have attempted to place this reconceived domestic United States in transnational history by exploring the ways that Cuban, Spanish, and Mexican ideas, actors, and conditions shaped US participants' sense of the possible in articles and in the second American revolution. I wanna acknowledge my efforts are incomplete, although I tried there to write a somewhat multi-sided history. This paper primarily uses Cuban history to examine the international roots of domestic US political history, not to develop a fully multinational analysis. While I have engaged in small scale research and archives in those countries, I rely primarily on excellent work by Cuban, Spanish and Mexican historians. Now back to Garland White. <clears throat> to explain Garland White's turn to Cuba, to connect black internationalism with filibustering, we have to turn backward and southward to the times and places that made an emancipatory invasion seem plausible, even necessary. One thread of this lies in the connection that US people had made between the fate of slavery in their country and in the US. Over the 19th century, as slavery in both societies boomed in what scholars call the second slavery. After the Haitian Revolution, Cubans imported slaves and exported sugar at astounding rates. And the Spanish government sustained its hold on the island through military rule as it lost its continental empire. Wonderful scholars have explored this, this growth and these crises, including Ada Ferrer, Manuel Garcia, Matt Childs, Alejandro de la Fuente, Ariela Gross, Rebecca Scott, Michelle Reed Vasquez, Rafael Rojas, among others. The island's crises were visible from the United States. The 1837 Officers' Rebellion for Constitutional Government, the 1843 to 44 Slave Rebellion, reinterpreted by Aisha Finch, and the late 1840s multiple crises analyzed by Romy Sanchez which included one fracture among Havana Matanzas sugar planters who feared that Spain would buckle in its commitment to slavery. Another fracture among white Creole Easterners, an area with less plantation slavery, who resented Spain's favoritism toward the Havana planters and feared the mass importation of slaves. And of course, a profound ongoing crisis among enslaved people themselves on the island. These Cuban crises grew from Cuban conditions, not primarily or originally from US meddling. And in fact, some Cubans had invited US meddling or intervention as a way to try to resolve their crises after the US and to gain the political upper hand after the US-Mexico war. Then, Planter Cristobal Madan wooed John O'Sullivan, the coiner of the phrase Manifest Destiny, with a grand dinner of disgruntled Havana area planters, then petitioned President Polk to purchase the island, then wooed O'Sullivan's sister. Other planters appealed to journalist Jane Casneau, pictured in the bottom corner, better known as Cora Montgomery, uh, and including her map, which shows the United States bleeding into Cuba and Hispaniola, a map of expansion and slavery, when she stopped there en route from reporting about the war in Mexico City. Like Garland White, these Cubans spoke of US soldiers in the streets of Havana, but they called in the late 1840s for the US to come in to save slavery, not to destroy it. Back in the United States, these journalists introduced young American politicians, including both Southern slaveholders and Northern supporters to prominent Cuban exiles like Domingo de Guayqueria, pictured in the upper corner, and Porfirio Valiente, and published annexation appeals in bilingual filibustering newspapers like La Verdad. They raised funds for Narciso Lopez's ill-fated filibustering missions, missions that aimed to bind Cuban slave owners to US slave owners in an expanded pro-slavery union. This interventionist dream by slave owners and their supporters prodded abolitionists to develop a counter internationalism that aimed to invoke the world to restrain the United States. Martin Delaney, pictured here, looked beyond US politics for signs of a transnational black rebellion 
which he found in the figure of Placido, pictured in his memorial in the upper corner, a poet and rebel in La Escalera, in letters to Frederick Douglass's newspaper, and then in his novel Blake, Delaney called for an emancip international emancipatory wave fueled by uprisings against the governments. Let the colored races look well to their own interests, Delaney urged. In Congress, abolitionist Joshua Giddings predicted that armed black Cuban slaves would indeed fight off US invaders and spark a Delaney style insurrection in Florida that would lead to the end of slavery in the United States. Meanwhile, others like Wendell Phillips look to the British empire as a way to restrain the United States. A correspondent of Douglass's who only marked his letter with the, with the letter H, his missive with the letter H, expected that Cuba annexationism would spark an almost universal conflict between the US and British empire over the future of slavery, one the British might win. And so many listened when an Afro-Canadian urged black, black people in the United States to compare the wholesome monarchical rule of liberty and the, to the slaveholders democracy in the United States. This was an appealing response to develop an anti-expansionist internationalism, emancipatory internationalism, but it was hard to sell to the US public. And in the 1850s, a voice that called for the development of an expansionist emancipatory internationalism by anti-slavery figures emerged, a voice that would be picked up later in the Civil War, emerged at first from a lonely, if very wealthy and plush perch, in that of the influential and wealthy abolitionist Garrett Smith, pictured here right behind Frederick Douglass and next to the Edmondson sisters at an 1850 Fugitive Slave Law Convention. Smith had helped convince Douglass to embrace political action and the anti-slavery power of the US Constitution. He was a supporter of John Brown, the Liberty Party and black land ownership in New York. No wonder that Douglass celebrated that Smith's 1852 congressional election would be a chance to halt slavery's expansion. But once in office, Smith baffled his allies by supporting Cuban annexation, though never invasion. Smith disliked abolitionist champion of the British Empire, their doubts about democracy. He recognized what he called the popular passion for territorial growth. He asked, could anti-slavery politics ever win if it seemed primarily to say no, to deny Americans their lust for expansion. He doubted it. So he argued they should invert the politics. The US should consecrate expansion by tying it to freedom. Cuba belongs to us, he wrote, by force of a geographical position, bringing Cuban slaves inside the United States would lead to the destruction of slavery in both the US and the island. We come not to be wedded to our slavery, but to die with it not to a bridal, but a burial. With regret and deep sadness, Douglas backed away, though he also scolded others for critiquing Smith personally. And other anti-slavery newspapers similarly started to develop a critique that acknowledged the potential for anti-slavery expansionism, even if not this application. We are for the extension of American empire, including Canada, one wrote, as long as that did not include slavery. Against the slave power, the liberty power, described by Corey Brooks, should embrace territorial acquisition, democracy and progress, not slavery and conservatism, and a global war against enslavement. Garrett Smith had lost the argument, but he had helped change its language and strategies, normalizing a patriotic anti-slavery expansionism that Garland White and others would turn to as the Civil War came. Now, this argument didn't emerge solely from thin air or eccentricity. It seemed to fit a set of facts visible in the 1850s to many anti-slavery observers, that they had reason for optimism. For one thing, the slave power was hardly the undefeated foe sometimes portrayed in anti-slavery propaganda and recent histories. The so-called Compromise of 1850 had disappointed many Southern politicians as the Fugitive Slave Act inspired extraordinary counter-mobilization and was difficult to enforce as Richard Blackett and Manisha Senna have shown. 
Meanwhile, the admission of California inaugurated what threatened to be a wave of new free states. Panicked Southern senators scrambled to balance California with Kansas, but that seemed doomed. And then they demanded Cuba in the Austin Manifesto, but Spain responded by tightening its grip on the island and arming black militiamen there and threatening emancipation. In response, Northerners developed harsh critiques of a slavery that wanted to expand outside and inside of the United States, critiques that found purchase in the Northern public. The Charleston Mercury reflecting backwards said the lesson of the 1950s was that the North had won. The slave power's weakness and overreach then created space for a viable anti-slavery coalition and the Republican party emerged as the opponent of slavery expansionism and also the champion of free labor settler colonialism. The home of a number of Northerners who saw an opportunity for free labor expansionism there as they saw Southern power weakening. Anti-slavery activists were not the only ones to see this shifting tide. Cuban exiles, always reading the lay of the land, recalculated their alliances, seeing the weakness of Southern politicians, and they began to woo anti-slavery internationalists to the side of annexation. The editors of New York's El Mulato, Francisco Aguero Estrada, and Juan Clemente Zenia had long called for a multiracial politics. Now other more moderate exiles like Guacoria and Pedro Santa Cecilia, his protege, tentatively explored anti-slavery and filibustering in pamphlets and speeches. We might well be skeptical of their sincerity, but the Spanish government watched these developments with fear. For the Spanish diplomats had long doubted slaveholders' ultimate influence in US politics, but long feared Northern public opinion. And now they feared the union of filibusteros and abolitionistas. Between 1860 and 1865, this burgeoning alliance saw reason to believe in the dreams of a final struggle over slavery would come true. For many black internationals like Garland White, the Emancipation Proclamation was the turning point. The proclamation could emancipate the world, not just the US South, they suggested, a death blow to world slavery that would make the US, not Britain, the day star of the world. The US government might be no longer the enemy to be restrained, but the tool to be utilized, even for those who doubted white Republicans' motives or stamina. Perhaps no one captured the sudden shocking emergence of black anti-slavery expansionism more clearly than Dr. Stephen Walter Rogers. North Carolina born and New Orleans based preacher, hymnist and newspaper editor. In a celebration of the state's abolition of slavery in 1864, he urged a mostly black audience of 25,000 on Congo Square to end world slavery and expand the US uh, and expand the United States. Cuba, Mexico and Canada would be added to our national domain in less than 300 years, the stars and stripes would wave over the Tower of London, Rogers predicted to cheers. In wonder, a correspondent for the National Anti-Slavery Standard asked, barely what have God wrought? Is this New Orleans? Do we dream? Rogers' 1864 dream of marching through Cuba and Garland White's dream of, uh, of marching, to, marching through Cuba did not come to fruition at that moment as internal crises between 1865 and 1867 distracted US policymakers. So Cuban insurgents reading the, reading the tea leaves bided their time as potential allies in the US and Mexico struggled with the US struggling over reconstruction, Mexican liberals over the expulsion and defeat of Emperor Maximilian. Still there were signs that the civil war might carry across the Gulf in this period. In Cuba, some enslaved people sang songs to Lincoln. Cuban officials worried over slave rebellion, some tied to rumors from the United States. Cubans at the docks chanted liberty when a US squadron sailed into harbor. Finally, in 1868, as both the US Republicans and Mexican liberals consolidated their power, the timing seemed right. In October, Cuban insurgents launched a rebellion against Spain, seeking international support with their proclamations. In practice, these insurgents were cautious, only accepting voluntarily freed people. But Ada Ferrer and others have shown that formerly enslaved people like Jose Manuel disregarded that caution and refashioned the conflict into a war for freedom. 
from offices on Broadway or Rosalia Hernandez and the Cuban Women's Committees, raised money for arms and propaganda, while sugar magnates and railroad executives brokered talks between Cuban insurgents and anti-slavery politicians like Charles Sumner and organizers enlisted volunteers to fight. Filibusters, but now pitched as filibusters for freedom. This changing spirit moved the Christian Recorder, the newspaper of the AME Church. In the 1850s, the newspaper critiqued annexation. Now it embraced the idea. America wants Cuba and Cuba wants America. Who shall keep them apart? Let us have it now. Telling the lead, the recorder believed the United States would bring anti-slavery, democracy, and not least our Protestant faith. In January 1869, a Pittsburgh Colored Men's Convention asked Congress to negotiate for the annexation of Cuba and Haiti. A love of race is what we need. And the New Orleans Tribune called upon Black Louisianans to defend enslaved Cubans and American Republicanism. But Black internationalists found it easier to gain access to government than to move that government to act. The Grant administration did not recognize the Cuban belligerents and did not want to risk war. That put Black internationalists in a challenging position. Supporting rebels against the US government's policy would make them pirates. Waiting for the government to act would make them false friends to fellow people of color. And then they confronted another challenge to their internationalism another opportunity for transformation. The revolution in Spain in fall 1868, a military rebellion spread to the streets of Madrid, toppling the monarch and inaugurating a liberalizing military regime. US minister Daniel Sickles frantically tried to purchase Cuba from the new Spanish governments. Sickles efforts showed the continuity and discontinuity in US expansionism. In the 1850s, he tried to buy Cuba from Spain to save slavery, now he worked relentlessly to purchase Cuba to end slavery. And he mustered support from British, French, and other anti-slavery societies, gathered Spanish abolitionists in his rooms to plot a path forward. And in 1873, those abolitionists helped depose a short-lived constitutional monarch and proclaimed the first Spanish Republic, backed by Sickles and US forces. For a few heady months, they discussed an entirely new regime, inspired in part by the United States. A United States of Spain with an emancipated Cuba incorporated as an equal partner. Sickles gloried. He promised Cuban emancipation quickly inside of Spain, but it was not so simple. Cuban insurgents wanted complete independence. Jose Marti flew a Cuban flag, not the flag of the Spanish Republic, in Madrid. Across Spain, civil wars raged against the Republic. And on Cuba, planters rejected both the Spanish Republicans and the insurgents claiming their own authority through paid mercenaries. In this baffling set of choices, would international emancipation come through an insurgency in Cuba or lobbying a new government in Spain? Most black abolitionists I've traced seem to rest their hopes in Cuba, not Spain. And their support prompted new forms of organizing to replace the now disbanded American anti-slavery society. Inventor Samuel Scotran, who had accompanied the third USCI through Florida as a settler, and Henry Highland Garnet, who had urged colonization to Africa, among many other fascinating positions, together organized a Cuban anti-slavery committee that Paul Ortiz has analyzed. Scotran and Garnet tied their struggles against the cruelties of family separation of the lash to the condition of enslaved people in Cuba. While you are enjoying the blessings of freedom, the voice of 500,000 of our brethren in chains is heard. Shall the 4 million in our own land stand idly by? It was the racial duty of free people to destroy slavery wherever it exists. Garnett declared Cuba must be free, God has decreed it. After collecting signatures at numerous mass meetings, Scotran, Garnett, George Downing, and John Mercer Langston petitioned President Grant to recognize the rebels as belligerents. Tentatively, they tried to sustain a non-expansionist but activist anti-slavery internationalism, a forerunner perhaps to the international anti-colonial movements of later times, but it did not represent the only option of international emancipationists as we will see. For in October, 1873, a new crisis inspired one more burst of black anti-slavery expansionism. Spanish warships captured the Virginias, 
a ship bearing US, British, and other citizens headed to Cuba to aid the insurgents. Filibusters in the American tradition, but now at least purportedly filibusters for emancipation. In these prisoners, royalist planters on the island of Cuba saw their opportunity to create chaos and undermine Madrid, pressing forward with executions. Spain's Republican president, abolitionist Emilio Castellar, tried to stop the executions, but planters ignored his orders. Soon, outraged US newspapers called for war. This chaos swept away the Cuban Anti-Slavery Committee's nuance. Anti-slavery expansionism once again resurged in war fever. And once again, Black voices helped carry the call. In New Orleans, PBS Pinchback, the only Black man to serve as governor in Reconstruction, raised funds for a new filibustrian expedition to Cuba with Confederate General James Longstreet, a unification of white Southerners expansionism and Black Southerners emancipationism. The most striking call in the fall of 1873 came from Savannah, Georgia, a hotbed of black activism. There, AME preacher Henry McNeil Turner had urged caution on the issue of Cuba as recently as February. In a Lincoln's birthday address, he acknowledged a desire to act, but also worried about violating the government's laws. But the Virginia's news swept away his reserve. In December 1870, in November 1873, Nine months later, Turner, with postal clerk and Republican activist Louis Toomer, an editor and Customs House Chief John DeVoe, convened an enthusiastic and large mass meeting of Black citizens to express indignation at the butchery of our fellow citizens in Cuba. We might pause here to reflect on Turner at this crossroads. Born free in South Carolina, Turner converted to Southern Methodism, then became an AME preacher. Like Garland White, he lobbied the US government to commission black chaplains and served as one. After surrender, he founded many AME churches, helped organize the Georgia Republican Party and served in the state's constitutional convention and then its legislature till he was expelled with 13 other black men by the vote of white legislators. A move so radical that Congress put Georgia back under military rule. In Savannah, he pastored St. Philip's AME and worked in the customs house. Later, he would become the first Southern Bishop of the AME and an immigrationist, studied by Edwin Redke, Stephen Angel, Tunde Adeleke, and Andre Johnson, who now runs the fine Henry McNeil Turner Project digital site. Throughout the 1870s, Turner wrestled with hope and despair, each emotion tied to his understanding of politics, of Black people's ability to wrest control of the federal government. He did not doubt the national government could be used for good, if it could be controlled. He championed the 1875 Civil Rights Act, the 1876 candidacy of James Blaine. But Turner did doubt whether black people could gain power over the federal government and began to talk about a black nation in Africa. At this crossroads in November, 1873, after the capture of the Virginias, Turner joined Toomer and DeVoe on the side of US might. Always an emancipatory internationalist, he stood poised between the US interventionism of the Civil War era and the immigrationism of the 1880s. And he broke backward. With Toomer and DeVoe, Turner pledged 5,000 black citizens of Savannah were ready to enlist for Cuba to, speech, to teach the Spanish authorities respect for the American flag. For this moment, US power, patriotism and emancipation seemed once again united. Black men in blue uniforms in an empire for liberty. But this moment also passed. People called for war, but the government did not, repeating a pattern that Spanish diplomats had long observed. The Grant administration feared the Spanish Navy, the depression of 1873, and the inevitable political struggle over annexation after the defeat of their efforts to purchase the Dominican Republic. Sickles, disappointed by pro-slavery presidents in the 1850s, would be disappointed by an anti-slavery president in the 1873. Diplomats resolved the crisis. Spain's Republican government then collapsed and was replaced by a military region, then a restored monarchy. On the island, the enslaved people sustained the insurgency, but many, rebels, many white rebels abandoned the cause. This confluence of events still confounds our analysis. It's not unusual to see anti-imperialist, even pacifist historians, scold the Grant administration for inaction, 
a sign that anti-slavery imperialism retains its allure, even for critical historians, because it's easy to overlook its premises. The end of the 1870s brought the end of these expansive, sometimes expansionist hopes. Spain prevailed over the insurgents. White supremacists drove black politicians out of office across the US South. Turner's Georgia replaced its Reconstruction Constitution with one backed by Garland White's old enslaver, Robert Toombs. In despair and fury, Henry McNeil Turner disentangled his internationalism from his earlier patriotism. Don't you see it as a white man's government, he asked. And don't you see they mean at all hazards to keep us down? Then why waste our time in trying to stay here? In a call that echoes, somewhat uncomfortably, new work by Elena Roberts and others on African-American settler colonialism, Turner asked, why not do as the white settlers of this country did, leave and build up a country and government of our own. Colonization, he wrote, has the sanction of heaven. Thereafter, black internationalism survived in a mostly anti-national form, though traces of the old vision endured in James Young's successful lobbying for black regiments to serve in Cuba and the war at the century's end. The Cuban Anti-Slavery Committee transfigured into the American Foreign Anti-Slavery Society, bold in its claims, limited in its influence, and negligible in its confidence in the US government. Henry Highland Garnett bitterly regretted that the veteran abolitionists of the United States had mustered themselves out of service and abandoned the cause of freedom in Cuba. And Cubans stopped expecting US help, even as they pressed for and obtained emancipation over the 1880s and launched a new uprising in the 1890s. The chances for interconnections and liberal imperialism that Garland White, Samuel Rogers, Henry McNeil Turner hoped for seemed to have passed. When US imperialism returned to Cuba, it arrived under the banner of segregation. From our vantage, we might look backward at the challenge that Cuba posed for mid-century Black Americans with a sense not of answers, but of suggestive questions. How might we wrestle with this history, brief and tentative as it might seem, of Black expansionism and even filibustering, understood in that broad sense? The potential to harness the United States power to the cause of emancipation led some Black activists to bind their longstanding internationalism to the US government to look anew at the prospects of conquest and annexation to make of the United States a liberal empire. We might ask about the role of religion in sustaining this crusading impulse. Garland White and Henry McNeil Turner were AME preachers. Stephen Rogers, a preacher and hymnalist, the AME's Christian recorder, a champion. We might use this moment to probe the relationship between crusading missionaries and empire as explored by James Campbell and Derek Chain. And does the fighting faith of soldiers and preachers help us understand the martial masculinity in their appeals and the challenges that pose for black women abolitionists to find their voice and role? Finally, how did black internationalists describe Cubans, at times as brothers, at times as children, at times as benighted Catholics? For Cuban historians, I wanna admit that I'm not convinced my talk has much new to add to subjects they have exceeded us in studying. My main lesson from the Cuban historiography and my small forays into archival work there in Spain and Mexico is the importance of reading it and doing it, of seeing what we learn by looking at the US from outward. But I take great heart in the entangled histories being produced, histories that sustain transnational approaches without losing sight of the enduring centrality of domestic politics and state formation, making domestic political history international and international history domestic. And for Reconstruction historians, I end with a conundrum I'm not sure we've successfully worked through. One exposed in Turner's simultaneous loss of faith in US power at home and abroad. In 1868 and even in 1873, Turner had faith in US power to intervene for civil rights in Georgia and to intervene for emancipation in Cuba, to create empires of abolition at home and abroad each rooted in a sense of the nation's capacity and its purpose. Why did those domestic and international hopes crumble together between 1873 and 1879? Did the collapse of white Northern support for reconstruction 
emerged in a dialogue with the loss of faith in liberal empire? Might we ask if there was a connection between Rogers's promises that there would be in the crusade of reconstruction, a combination of abolition and empire? And might this reckoning with this potential popular base of reconstruction and its dissolution lead us toward new narratives of reconstruction that help us to wrestle with abolition, with empire, with power, and also with its perils. I appreciate your time and your attention and greatly look forward to the questions. Oh man, that was dazzling. That was so exciting. And I have uh, yielded the, the microphone as it were <laughs> and the camera to my friend Alejandro. Alejandro, thank you so much for that marvelous introduction. And then uh, with Abby's permission, I'll, I'll ask the second question. Alejandro, you first. Thank you, Skip. Thank you. And thank you, Greg, for a wonderful lecture. I'm gonna second Skip's enthusiasm for a, for a great presentation. And for really, um, for really um, illustrating how intertwined the, these uh, stories are and uh, how important it is to, to look at some of these processes beyond national borders. I, I, I really liked how you um, complicated the relationship between abolitionism and filibustering, which are typically uh, treated as polar opposites, really. Um, to the point that I ended up thinking whether filibustering still works as a concept uh, for all these uh, forms of, um, of, of intervention, right? Or whether we need to rethink the label itself. And also the, the connections, which we have certainly seen before, but uh, which I think you um, highlighted quite effectively between black abolitionism, patriotism, and empire. Um, this uh, brought to mind some of the work that Rebecca, that Rebecca Scott has done on Louisiana and how uh, black activists in Louisiana used Cuba sometimes as a, as a proxy to claim respectability and standing and, and, and participation. So I wanted to ask a couple of uh, questions. Uh, and, and, and I suppose in some ways that you know, I, I suppose in some ways my questions kind of flip the coin by uh, by by looking from the Cuban end, right, to, to some of the processes that you are you won't be surprised to hear that. Um, and one is uh, one one question has to do with the relationship with between black internationalism as a reaction to uh, to this kind of pro-slavery internationalism that you describe and that is associated with filibustering in its traditional sense. And as, as I heard you speak about this, I was thinking whether it is possible to come up with a, a different chronology here, one in which black internationalism is um, takes precedence uh, by grounding, you know, by simply paying attention to an earlier moment around the Haitian revolution and how ideas uh, and people uh, displaced by uh, revolutionary conflict in Haiti crisscross the, uh, the Caribbean and come also into the United States, certainly to a place like Louisiana in the early uh, 19th century. And, and as you know, there is a, now a fairly solid body of work, Julio Scott, uh, Ferrer, Matt Childs, who have explored this network. So, you know, I wonder if we can actually think about these uh, networks of, of, uh, of black internationalism, if we can separate them somehow from, uh, if they're not just a reaction to uh, pro-slavery internationalism, but that there is something, that, that there is another historical chronology here. And the second question is more of a kind of a big picture question. And it's a question that I always, always haunts me. I, I, I absolutely agree with the, um, with the general idea that U.S. slavery, that slavery in the U.S. South was absolutely critical to slavery in places like Cuba and Brazil. And in fact, we have very solid evidence that slave owners in both Brazil and Cuba were paying very serious attention to what was happening uh, in the US South and vice versa, that somehow these slave societies 
these second slave societies were kind of uh, all in the same boat. And as you know, also there is now a, a large body of work that also shows how the slave trade was reorganized during the 19th century with the participation of, uh, of actors from these three societies. And I, again, I, I absolutely do not dispute that. I, I totally agree with that. But I do want to ask you the following question, which is a question for which I do not have an answer, and maybe you do. I'm always surprised, actually, about the, uh, the capacity of slavery to endure and to survive because it took 20 years after the end of slavery in the US for slavery to end in Cuba, two wars later, and in Brazil after enormous mobilization. So in a sense, what surprises me is how, is how, um, is how long it took for slavery to end after uh, emancipation in the US uh, South. You know, is, is that compatible is, you know, we may think that 20 years is not a long time, but, you know, we are all, all of us old enough to know that 20 years, actually, it's, it's not such a small period of time. So I don't know if you have thoughts about this um, or how we can think about this relationship. Well, Alejandro, some people would say slavery didn't end in 1865 yeah. in the United yeah. States. It just morphed. But um, uh, I didn't mean to jump the gun. Go ahead, Professor. <laughs> well, thank you, Alejandro. Those are uh, really provocative questions. I've got a longer effort to grapple with the second one. The first, then I'll take uh, quickly and just uh, plead, uh, you know, plead no contest. I think um, I originally had a lo even longer version, you know, that did aim to situate the early 19th century. Um, and in there, I was uh, more careful about exploring, you know, the ways that abolitionism had been founded as an international impulse. And as you said, Black abolitionists, including especially uh, the Louisiana examples you mentioned, um, had an international vision long predating um, you know, this, uh, this time period. Um, as I whittled it down, I got a little heavy-handed in some of the transitions. And the other thing that I might say is that the centrality of Cuba, um, as opposed to other places, you know, emerged understandably over the 1840s um, because of the emancipation of the British Empire is something else that I had, had gestured to in, a, in an earlier version and hope I you know, handled more adeptly in print. Um, so I would absolutely agree um, that when we're looking at an abolitionist international and when we're looking at a black international imagination, um, that we want to be starting much earlier, right? You know, uh, possibly at the, at the very beginning. Um, and uh, that it's uh, the piece the, of the reaction I was interested in um, was as the recognition of a pro-slavery internationalism growing, which you know is is more of the novelty, in the context that uh, you know prior to Haiti, pro-slavery internationalism uh, you know would have been a uh, unnecessary qualifier, right? Um, and as pro, especially after the British uh, emancipations, as pro-slavery internationalism grows. Um, that it does create changes in, a, I would agree, long-standing anti-slavery internationalism. So that's the piece I was uh, hoping to get at in that gesture. But I would absolutely agree with the earlier, with the importance of grounding in an earlier chronology. How important is the U.S. anyway? I think this is a fascinating question. Um, you know, for this, I tried to stay grounded in um, the sources that I, uh, you know, found and that I also saw that other scholars had found. And it is, you know, true that many people on many sides uh, assume that take this as for granted. Southern planters assume that their slavery depends upon its survival in Cuba. Cuban planters assume that it depends. Anti-slavery in the North assume they're intertwined. Critics of slavery assume they're intertwined. Um, the Spanish government assumes they're intertwined. As you know, as you well know, at the Civil War's end, the Spanish government moves toward a uh, exploration of gradual emancipation on the grounds that whether they want to keep slavery or not, it doesn't matter. Now that it's over in the US, surely it will end. The remarkable thing about that, though, is, as you say, that um, on the facts of the matter is that it's actually very hard to figure out how important the end of slavery in the U.S. actually was. Um, you know, that um, not only did none of those uh, predictions come true in the short term, 
Uh, the end of slavery in Cuba, I, you know, I think as a non-specialist, uh, you know, how important, you know, if you're writing solely from there, how important, you know, this is, you know, beyond my, uh, you know, you know uh, expertise, but if I had to answer that, I would say I'm not sure at all how important U.S. emancipation is. So the way that I write about it in, in, in the book is to say that the gap between British emancipation and the U.S. Civil War is not that far different from the gap between the U.S. Civil War and the completion of emancipation in Cuba. How important, how significantly do U.S. historians figure the British imperial emancipation? It mattered, it's a context, but I think we would all say, well, no, the dynamics remains influenced by external events and yet profoundly internal. Uh, in fact, one of the things that I wanted to do was shake up some of the ways that US historians after acknowledging that turn relentlessly internal and to say that even things like the Cuba, the Kansas crisis, what turned a great deal upon their understanding of the relationship legal and ideological between Kansas and the acquisition of Cuba. Um, and I think that's probably the model that I would plead to if I, you know, if, if I had to go beyond my expertise and to suggest that surely it matters, uh, you know, as a, as a preceding context. And yet surely if you're explaining Cuban emancipation, the most important start part of the story is the story on the ground. And I think that's really fascinating for the reasons you raised. Why didn't emancipation, uh, you know, nobody is really arguing that it doesn't make a difference at all in the, uh, in the 1860s. How is it that people so ideologically um, contradictory have shared what turned out to be a common uh, misassumption? And my suggestion would be that it does go back to, to the strength of slavery and that even as abolitionists start to wrestle with governance and the strength of slavery, it's hard for anybody to really grapple how powerful, even as they acknowledge it, how powerful slavery really is. Mm -hmm. uh, the sort of primitive version of a domino theory is, is so influential. And of course, then US historians write that in by a kind of imperialist narrative, right? That we change the world, which is the untenable kind of US uh, move to transnationalism. So I don't know if that's satisfactory. But, oh, uh, <clears throat> absolutely. Thank you so much, Greg. You know, in a sense, the same thing happens with the wars of, in the, of independence in Spanish America. We assume that there is a relationship, and there is some relationship, but the wars end in the 1820s, and emancipation doesn't happen until the 1840s, 50s, and sometimes <laughs> 60s. So, you know, we need to examine this critically and try to at least question that, that what that relationship means. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah, great, great question and, and fabulous answer. Um, I, I would add, um, pose almost as a, a question, um, might the centrality of Cuba have um, emerged and remained not so much because of the the abolition of slavery, but the but the continuation of the slave trade. The failure, the, remember the slave trade is abolished in uh, Britain in 1807 and in the States in 1808. But it just is taking off in Cuba in ways that we only recently uh, fully understand through the work of, among others, my wife, the great historian, Mary Alec Iglesias, who said, who's upstairs watching. <laughs> and her student, <laughs> um, um, and her student and, you know, all their uh, research is uh, Jorge Felipe. The research has now been incorporated into the transatlantic slave trade database. But incredibly, um, you know, the slave trade, just because we have a general audience, slavery in Haiti ends on January 1st, 1804. And so did the Cuba, I mean, so did the sugar industry. It, did, it just moved, you know, so like 50 miles or something between more or less between Cuba and Haiti, and so the sugar industry moves to Cuba. And then, Mary, I will correct me, but I think 600,000 Africans come there after Haiti is liberated through the illegal slave trade. So you have to remember that everybody is aware of this. This is not a secret to anybody. To, you know, when Alejandro, or, or I, I, well, one of you said, you know, why would, Slave remained so important. I did like this. He was making so much money, you know, through sugar. People were becoming our equivalent of billionaires in Havana because of the illegal slave trade. And we know that uh, slavery didn't end in Cuba until 1886. And 
Alejandro, when did the slave trade end? 1860s? Yeah, 1860s, so roughly about the same time of the emancipation in the US. But still, slavery survives even 20 years after that. I know, but the, but the, the politics of the slave trade mm -hmm. cannot be underestimated because we have people sure, like sure. Uh, John C. Calhoun. I'm a graduate of Calhoun College at Yale. There, they weren't talking, they weren't only concerned about uh, his big cause was to reopen the slave trade. That was like turning a faucet and gold would be pouring out. And that, because they could see it happening 90 miles south of Key West. You know, the slave trade, people were just flowing in and, and all this money was, was being made. So I would suggest that in addition to the emancipation of the industry, you, um, as you think about this, Greg, the, take into account the emancipation of the slave trade and the envy that slaveholders had in America at the wild west, not, wild west is the wrong metaphor. I don't know what, but, but the, the, just the uh, uninhibited profit making from the importation of illegally of, of Africans all through, I mean, from 1808 all up through, you know, to the civil war basically, which was, and, and it drove people like <laughs> John C. Calhoun crazy because they, they wanted that wealth too. Not, so they wanted to keep up the infusion of Africans, vastly expand slavery, um, as well as perpetuate the institution of slavery itself. So that's just an observation. I'd love your comments, but I have a couple more comments so you can make your notes. One is um, this international link between black Americans and uh, Cuba first starts in black literature in 1760 with what we literary critics um, consider the first slave narrative by Britton Hammond. It's very short. It's in our Norton Anthology of African American Literature. And he just mentions in passing, it's the first slave narrative, Alejandro, and he mentions in passing that he goes to La Habana. <laughs> and then he comes back. <laughs> and it took me years to know Till I met Mary, I didn't know what La Habana was, you know. <laughs> so th this consciousness of the relationship between the United States and Cuba within Black letters starts at the beginning of Black letters itself with the very first slave narrative in 1760. The second point, I'm glad you mentioned, I didn't hear you say at the end, uh, at the beginning, that Garland White was an AME minister, but you did hit that point at the end and of course, uh, Henry McNeil Turner is my man. And I write about him in the last chapter of Stony the Road because he shows up at the Atlanta Exposition and he's interviewed by the journalist who writes about Booker T. Washington as the first new Negro. And he says, that's bullshit. And, <laughs> and, and, as long as, uh, ain't no such thing as a new Negro. And as, uh, as um, our colleague, Martha Patterson, who's probably on the, uh, online one of our fellows who's done more research into the history of the discourse of the new negro than than anybody though i think i might be second you know <laughs> <laughs> and uh but um they, they the, so the role of the ame church and the christian recorder that has to be explored you know these guys didn't come out of, um, of no place and the christian recorder is writing editorials about it before they are you know, you know, articulate because Blake in the House of America is 1859. And, um, you know, Bishop Turner, as you say, you know, morphs, he changes. And you gave those two marvelous quotes. Um, the second thing is, I would, or third thing, I would wonder, given the role of the AME Church, which itself is an internationalist uh, movement, as soon as they can, they're sending missionaries to South Africa, for goodness sake, right? So by the 1890s, they're there, at least, uh, and if Evelyn Higginbotham is online, she can correct me, but I know by the 1890s, they are in South Africa converting uh, Black South Africans to the AM, AME Church. They have a long um, and profound uh, influence back and forth with South Africa, leading up to Mandela being in prison and, you know, and then finally um, being liberated. So I'm interested in the role of Christianity and particularly Black Christianity and more particularly the AME church. And then you have uh, Bishop Holly, who 
founds the Episcopal Church in Haiti, and he leaves New Haven in 1861. So all this is sort of overlapping this internationalism. And remember, he's trying to persuade Frederick Douglass to go with him. And Douglass even buys a ticket or talks about buying the ticket. And then Fort Sumter happens because Douglass' daughter, David Blight, is eloquent about this as all things Douglass. But um, I think that Douglass was more tempted to leave after Dread than David does. Uh, for David, it was like, well, I'm going to humor my daughter and go down there. But if you were a black person after the Supreme Court said, you weren't a citizen, you never were a citizen, you never were going to be a citizen. The founders did not even think of you as a human being, basically. That had to be like the darkest day in, in African-American history, certainly in the history of, of free um, African-Americans. Um, and finally, um, so, you know, I'm just saying there's the conflicts, confluence of church figures uh, thinking about Black internationalism and colonization and um, annexation. And speaking of annexation, you didn't, I don't believe, mention Frederick Douglass's opinion about uh, Santo Domingo and th that commission, which you might add, you know, in the longer version, because it certainly ties in. And there's Douglass, who was, yeah, we want to colonize, we want to colonize, we want to appropriate the whole thing. And he gives us his justification. It will increase the number of black people. Uh, forget the fact that it's taking away the independence <laughs> of another people, which leads finally to my final point, which is that for years. Now, remember, I'm, I take my first Afro-American history course at Yale in 1969, 1970. So that's the context. So for us, what we now call black internationalism or pan-Africanism, that was seen as a radical um, action. Nobody, what, and it, it just showed our own ignorance of and condescension to indigenous African cultures. The idea that Africa was basically empty or that there were people there just waiting on the brilliant liber, liber, liberatory uh, influence of wisdom of the vanguard of the Negro peoples as African-Americans called themselves in the literature, you know, is so not, it's, I think racist is the wrong word, but it is so, it's condescending, but it's worse. You know, it is colonialist. Pan-Africanism was colonialist from the get-go. And it took me years to think of it that way. I think I first started thinking about it when, um, we were we started reading George Schuyler uh, on Liberia, and you know, and he writes that book like I forget what it's uh, the ironic title, but it's about how horrendous the African Americans treated the native um, um, Liberians. But then when you think of that, and then you go back and look at all these Pan African movements. I mean, Marcus Garvey, remember he's our hero. We are thinking of, uh, and Martin Delaney was a Pan-Africanist until he was made an officer by Lincoln in the Civil War, right? I mean, and his um, um, proceed, you know, his, what, what's it called on the uh, uh, Niger River? Sorry, it's my doorbell. I think they're delivering food. <laughs> you were worried about your kids coming. Now we got, um, we, we have delivery men and, or What are we people. having? <laughs> yeah, but uh, you know, when he went to the Niger River, the Niger River Valley, exploration and wrote about that, I think in 1852. There's a long history of the fantasy of a free black nation in Africa, but the subtext is always at the expense of the Africans who live there. Alexander Crummel, the only black man before whom the great Du Bois bowed. Alexander Crummel graduates from Cambridge, the University of Cambridge in 1853. Where does he go? To Liberia and stays there for 20 years. And believe me, he wrote some very difficult things to stomach about indigenous African culture, but that was informed, of course, by his own deep uh, Anglican Christianity. So at least we can put that in the context. But um, these discourses are enormously complicated and the simple integrationist, pan-Africanist, assimilationist triad that uh, black scholarship, I mean, by that, I mean, scholarship of African-American intellectual thought 
that emerged in the late 60s and extended through the 70s and the Black Arts Movement and Black Power, et cetera, was not complex enough because it, it did not see Black on Black colonialism as being possible. You know, it just never occurred to people that that would be, that Marcus Garvey leading African-Americans back to the continent would be anything but hailed this wonderful moment in the, the what we now call Yorba land, you know, <laughs> or, or, the, or the rest of Africa. Anyway, I've gone on too long, but I hope that you can comment on some of these points. Well, those can are, I, uh, those are right, uh, tremendously uh, helpful and inspiring. I mean, I um, <clears throat> want to, uh, you know, to, to respond and also to make sure to make uh, room for any other, other questions. The slave trade, you're absolutely right, as well as, uh, you know, in the incredible scholarship, uh, that has come out on the on centering this 19th century slave trade, both to, to Cuba and Brazil, um, including on questions of who's actually profiting, right? You know, not what flag are they flying under, but how do these work as corporations? Um, you know, I haven't done any of that work, but I hope I've learned some things from it, and 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 it does raise really profound questions about what they hoped to uh, to accomplish as they hoped to acquire and bring in uh, bring in Cuba. There were Southern slave owners who said uh, the cost of Cuba will be the end of the slave trade. Uh, you know, in other words, that they were vote counters also um, and uh, that this that this, you know, created some disquiet as well as some of these oddities of, uh, you know, Southern slave owners including Jefferson Davis uh, and Matt Carpkitz on some of this, uh, who are like, are we so sure we want to risk the Spanish Navy sailing into Savannah with gunboats, right? Like, uh, how, how confident are we um, that this is going to end well, even if uh, we somehow wrest control of Cuba? Um, and their heightened awareness of this, this long history of uh, seaboard emancipation during, during foreign wars, right? Going back to their knowledge of the War of 1812 and the Revolution. Um, so there's no question, I don't have an answer for exactly how much of uh, this changes as the slave trade and its many political, financial, and other permutations. Um, and you raised a question with the slave trade that is something that in some ways reflects back on Alejandro's question, um, and that I will pose as a question, but which I am pleased to not have to answer, uh, you know, which is, you know, the thing that as I, you know, I teach, uh, you know, almost every year at a Ferrer's uh, most recent book, and uh, the question that students ask there is, is this a book about the limits of the impact of the Haitian Revolution on world history? In other words, that a, a narrative that had marked it, right, just as US historians have marked civil war as the death of slavery. How are we supposed to really reckon with the incredibly uh, clear points she makes about how quickly world slavery responds to the, you know, to emancipation in Haiti. And the quickest answer to that, as you alluded to, is Cuba, which is a mass importation and a massive expansion. And it makes me uncomfortable with all of those sort of landmarks, right? You know, in the kind of hundred year history of, of, uh, of Atlantic uh, slave abolition, of what exactly, when exactly are the inflection points when slavery as a hemispheric phenomenon is weakened? And when is it being diverted? Um, Roberto Saba has a very good book that's just about out on the intense interrelationship between U.S. business interests and the end of slavery in Brazil, which is something I didn't touch on, but uh, there's, yeah, so it's, um, all of these, I think, uh, raise some really interesting questions about what happens is if you do a kind of long history of, you know, not, you know, of what, how do things actually get altered um, by these flashpoints or crises moments. Um, I love the uh, story of Britton Hammond. I don't, I don't know it. I need to check that out. And I wonder if he was there in the British occupation uh, that uh, Elena Schneider has written about, or if he's there before the, uh, the British occupy Havana, but um, I'll have to check that out. Um, and then the question on the AME church, which, uh, you know, I find fascinating. I'm not along with the many things I'm blundering into. I'm not a religious historian either. So uh, why not? Uh, you know, be, uh, you know, why not be, uh, you know, blundering into there. 
I do think that, as you point out, the missionary impulse, the crusading impulses, um, a, it strikes me that the British literature on abolitionism is possibly clearer on attributing abolitionist power to a kind of crusading impulse that can be directly tied to an imperial project. And that the American historiography, US historiography has been slower to incorporate um, that and that um, we also see uh, preludes to the points that, the, that you raised, even in things like the Chesapeake Bay and, uh, and uh, North Carolina, sound uh, enslaved people who run to British ships, those who end up in Africa are often um, embroiled in these kind of conflicts with native people, um, and that really uh, do suggest the deep you know, history of this uh, struggle to, you know, whether to understand arrival in Africa as, as many people have written about as a moment of brotherhood or as a moment of parenthood, which is another, you know, another uh, or conversion. And I think Catholicism in the Cuba question is one that is um, really hard to untangle in part because it messes with some of the other storylines of either clear ideology or clear race. There are clearly people who are uncomfortable uh, with the incorporation of, ca of a Catholic state as uh, who are as uncomfortable with that as they are uncomfortable with the incorporation of a multiracial state. Um, and uh, this deep anti-Catholicism and the confidence of the Christian recorder of, well, we'll just make Methodists of all of them, which, uh, you know, I'm a Methodist, it's a uh, very Methodist belief. But I have my doubts about it as a perspective, uh, perspective analysis. Um, so I think that there's a lot um, that has been done, but also a lot um, to do about this internationalist vision. Uh, I'm especially fascinated by the AME because of some of the things that you pointed out. And you're right that Turner in many ways is a, a figure, you know, for whom I'm so excited about Andre Johnson's biography, but there should be like seven biographies of, uh, of Turner coming out in the next five years or something. He's just a figure who reveals so many of these facets, including some of those assumptions that you pointed out that we can make about, a, about the directions of black internationalism at different moments. He's pretty clear about celebrating uh, settler colonialism as the model to follow. Without a doubt. And Abby sent me a, a link. We were waiting on more questions to come on. So she said, okay, step up. And then as I was given more questions, she said, okay, that's enough. That's enough. <laughs> <laughs> so we are going to, we're going to extend because we do have other questions. Great. I and as long, long as you don't mind, I ain't going anywhere. No, no, I'm here. I'm having fun. You know, out that window right there's COVID. So I'm saying right here. Right? <laughs> Where Turner. would we go? But you know, Henry McNeil Turner is a giant yes. and enormously complicated. You know, they, they thought even just to add a little wrinkle, traditional ways of worshiping. I have a new series coming out on the Black Church. He yes. thought that was like devil worship, you know? Yeah. <laughs> There's a story, he jumped out of a pulpit, he goes south after, uh, during Reconstruction. Mm -hmm. And he, he's looking at this traditional African-American uh, church service. He jumps out of the pulpit, Evelyn Higginbotham uh, told me this story and I put it in the series and goes, no, stop, stop, you're worse than the devil, you're worse than the devil. But the final thing I'll say is remember Livingston's motto and the motto of, of people, uh, um, uh, penetrating the quote unquote the continent with the three C's civilization, commerce, and Christianity. And they were like braids of hair, you know, strands of hair being braided. They were all tied together and they had an ideology that was, they thought was positive with all these things were wrapped up together. And black people were no exception. Anyway, Abby, take it away. We're going to go ahead and let everyone ask their question. And you don't have to group the questions yet. It's only it's not even 5:30 yet. And in California, man, he just we're just about having finishing lunch. So that's can... right. I've still got my coffee going. So I'm, <laughs> I'm, glad, I'm glad to be here. Yeah. So thank you so much. This was thank you. Great. Um, I'll add to that. Um, I will at while um, actually at some point while Skip was talking, Marielle Iglesias did send a question and, and it connects to some of what Skip was saying. So I'm curious to know if you have a little bit more to say about that. Um, she says, expansionism knows no color. Frederick Douglass was appointed by the Harrison administration in 1889 as minister resident and council general to Haiti and charged a affair to, for Santo Domingo. 
helping the US imperialistic agenda in the Caribbean. What do you make out of that? Or do you have anything that you would want to add to that at this point? Yeah. That's a great question and a, and a fraught question. Um, for one thing, uh, you know, the, uh, you know, I've spent part of this being the uh, less, at least expert person on Cuba. Now I'm going to be the least expert person on, uh, on Frederick Douglass. That doesn't sound like a, uh, a winning strategy. Um, I, I mean, obviously, the, uh, I agree with the first part. Um, and, you know, this is something, you know, uh, as, as you know better than I do as, as well uh, traveled in the literature. Um, but one of the things that I'm struck by um, in, in reading some of these, these transformational moments in the 1860s um, is how American they sound. Mm -hmm. um, in other words, uh, how much the opening of the possibility of seizing control of the government, not seizing, you know, but, you know, a bit of, of gaining control of the government creates not only a kind of potential patriotism, which is never that naive, um, you know, but in all kinds of um, habits of mind uh, that just strike me as very uh, widespread in, in 19th century. Um, U.S. thought. Uh, so I guess I'm, uh, you know, I think the, the question was well posed as one about, you know, the degree to which it's, uh, you know, um, I mean, it, it, it's, in some ways, I think it's difficult for us to reconstruct, you know, these are about things that you've written about, Skip, uh, very eloquently. The ultimate, um, I want to choose the word rightly, because I don't like the word defeat, but the ultimate limits and disappointments of reconstruction stand so tall that it makes it difficult for us to reconstruct how so now how broad some of those hopes were. And you portrayed that well, both in your right and in Stony the Road and in the documentary. And of course, scholars back from uh, Du Bois, right, who this is, uh, you know, lecture is named for, have tried to capture that expansiveness and we know it and it's still hard to grapple with the, the effects um, that it had. Um, and so I think understanding the ways that expansionism, I mean, that expansive moment of the Civil War, that ex idea that they might capture the state, they might capture state governments. Therefore, what were the aspects of the US that they could turn to their purposes? That's a very alluring idea, right? You know, they didn't get power to do nothing with it, right? And, uh, you know, that, uh, that idea that they look to precedent, right? You look to the Fugitive Slave Act and say, let's invert it to make the 1866 Civil Rights Act. Um, they could have been more aware of Richard and Manisha and others as a research on the ways that it turned out to be difficult to enforce the Fugitive Slave Act. But that sense that they wanted to take this power and invert it opens up a lot of, uh, you know, both positive and also a space for some of the things that, you know, we're, we have more negative views about. in Well, the well you know, and, and we see it, and Abby, I'll be very brief, I promise, I'll, I won't keep riffing, but Jim Claverin is a friend of mine, and I interviewed him, as you know, for Reconstruction, and let it, historians will always, I hope, remember that a Black man made the second Roman, a second Roman Catholic president of the United States, Jim Clyburn rescued Joe Biden's candidacy. He pushed the button. He looked at the candidates. He said, that's my man. He won South Carolina. And within a week or, or two weeks, everybody else was gone. I mean, it was like, but, uh, and as you know, one of the things I harp on, it, because it was such a surprise to me, is this simple fact that I want everybody online to remember. South Carolina, Mississippi, Louisiana, majority black states, Florida, Alabama, Georgia, almost majority of black states. That was the first manifestation of black. And that scared the bejesus, not only out of the former Confederates, but in my opinion, liberal white people in the North. Nobody thought 80% of black men would actually register to vote. Nobody. And think that they could elect the president, which in the popular vote, they did, right? right? All, all bets were off after that. That to me, was, it was the Freedom Summer 1867 and that general election. And after that, people go, whoa, whoa, these Negroes think they are like our agents, you know, and they can be. Anyway, go ahead. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, that's great. I would also just put in a plug, as you well know, that Congressman Clyburn, former history and social studies teacher. And oh, yes. the architect of the uh, of the plan for the uh, Buford Reconstruction Monument. So well, if you go in, 
you know, I filmed him in his office on the hill. It's like a reconstruction museum. Yeah, and that's right. He walks me through all of the uh, reconstruction congressmen, and there's one uh, who is very light complected, and he goes, ah, well, I don't know. About him. We, think <laughs> was, we think he was passing, you know. <laughs> Anyway, well, you go probably ahead, know that when um, we were working with the Park Service, when Kate Mazur and I were working with the Park Service and many other historians to help develop uh, the plan for the Reconstruction National uh, Monument, um, and Congresswoman Clyburn was a great uh, champion of it. Um, but he said, what's this with going into the 1890s? I taught reconstruction for 15 years. It ends in 1877. And uh, Park Service people had to kind of uh, do some briefings to say, you know, scholars no longer use the 1877. Um, the but, yeah, long reconstruction. The long reconstruction. What scholars do is reinvent eras to get more books. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> the yeah, Enlightenment. But, the Enlightenment now goes from like the Renaissance to, you know, uh, <laughs> the Civil War. Anyway, Abby, what, what's next? Uh, well, actually, here is a book or a question about Reconstruction. Um, and I think it might flip the terms you've been speaking in a little bit. So we'd be curious to hear about it. Um, it comes from Samantha Payne. And she says, in your work, The Second American Revolution, you make a strong argument for the revolutionary potential of reconstruction, but you rest that potential in large part on the actions of a group of bloody constitutionalists who you define mostly as members of the Republican Party establishment after the US Civil War. How do you think the black internationalist vision you described in this lecture shaped the revolutionary potential of reconstruction? Well, that's a great question. So very quickly, just to, uh, and it's a, uh, a question that reflects uh, the, the questioner, whom I don't know, uh, reading of the book. So uh, let me uh, very quickly try and sketch out. So one aspect, two, you know, two thirds of, of this book is about the international, of that book is about the international um, nature of, of uh, the, the Civil War era, and especially the, the ways that Cuba is central into US politics, not only because of fantasies, but because of, of actions. Um, but one chunk of it is about an effort to try and, and reinterpret um, the constitutional transformation um, in light of our understanding of, uh, of well, you can new work on how revolutions progress. And some of the reasons why for all the times that scholars would call the US Civil War and Reconstruction of Revolution, almost nobody believed them. Right, scholars in other fields, even though it's the greatest people, Du Bois, Foner, right? You know, no, it's never. Uh, you know, you get a sociological, you know, political scientist do a guidebook. They never include the U.S. Civil War. I don't mean never, but almost never. And so we had had not been able to to convince them. And so I explore there some of the ways of of making that case. And some of that goes into the ways that the thoughts we have on revolutions have changed over the last uh, 30 or 40 years that rather than a sort of vanguard of defining the revolutions through, uh, you know, France, uh, Russia, China, um, and, you know, that we've gotten more, much more interested in smaller revolutions and also in the ways that some of these uh, incorporate themselves um, by a kind of flashpoint moment of forcible violent transformation, but an effort to return to a constitutional order. To mean to be interested in non-utopian revolutions. Um, and that's how I tried to reinterpret the US Civil War era that it gets, uh, certainly it has many different impulses. You know, one of the real causes of it is Southern planters who didn't intend for it to go this way at all, obviously. But that a number of um, what we used to think made the Civil War not revolutionary is in fact one of the things that makes it revolutionary, which is that a large number of people who looked and sounded like moderates suddenly came to embrace uh, what I think we should define as a violent, and if any, you know, I don't think this term has any meaning in wartime, but essentially illegal and extra constitutional uh, transformation. Uh, and we have such a desire to make the 14th Amendment a fulfillment of the Constitution, but it's not. If we passed an amendment now where we excluded a large chunk of Congress and we put states under military rule and said you have to do it, obviously we would see this in another country and say, this is not normal uh, procedures. 
Um, and so that what is it about the desire to normalize that transformation, to make it part of American history? And what does that tell us both about the hold of the first founding and the first American Republic? And what would happen if we thought of it dying and collapsing and the US having something as Bruce Ackerman legal theorist has written about something more like what you see in other countries, right? There's a second American Republic. It's really founded in extra constitutional violent forms in the, uh, in the 1860s. Um, and then Ackerman argues it's displaced by a third Republic in the, in the, in the 1900s. That's, uh, that's not something I have a big stake in. Um, so for that reason, I was interested in those points of violence. Um, what are the ways that violence, we've always had a hard time bringing violence into our understanding of how politics work. We've gotten better at incorporating white supremacist violence, but we do it by saying it's not normal. Um, you know, it's this other, you know, piece out there. But in fact, violence shaped American politics throughout its history, as Crystal Feimster, when I was on a panel with her once, someone said, how do you, uh, you, know, you know, when do you bring in violence in American history? And she said, well, you know, what am I talking about, right? It is a history shaped by, by multiplicity of, of violence. And that what is it that we, how is it that we've obscured the violent origins? Here's a really crude way of saying it, the violent origins of the things we like, right? It's easy to find the violent origins of the things we dislike. And how have we obscured that? And how does that prevent us from understanding some of the difficulties and challenges of changing an American political system? Uh, that we tell it over in one way, a cautious story of reconstruction as if it happened in normal ways, which it didn't. And in the process, we tell an overly optimistic story about its lessons for change, um, which is if we obscure the methods, then we assume that we can get there without using those methods. And I hate to be a pessimist, but I have, I have my doubts. Um, I'm in a group with Sandy Levinson and, and others who are exploring some of these questions. So that was the reason there that I emphasized this issue of how do you make a constitution and why is it in other revolutionary eras there is this sort of centrality in other revolutionary studies of who is aligned with the military at what moments to make what things happen. And why are we uncomfortable with that as a portrayal of reconstruction? It goes back to some of, some of the work I did in After Appomattox. Um, that said, these things only happen um, because of actors who are moving the context. Some of those are Southern planters, right? Who without secession, many of the things we know wouldn't have happened. And some of those are people, but you know, black internationalists and abolitionists, as well as white internationalists and abolitionists in the 1840s and 1850s were deliberately trying to break open American politics and to make a space to say, the fight of American politics is a fight over the future of the world. Um, and I do try and incorporate that, but you know, it's hard to, to do everything uh, equally well. And that fight over the future of the world turns in part on their understanding of the relationship to Cuba, even if as Alejandro uh, suggested, they might be overly uh, optimistic about how the impact of that relationship. And that fight over the future of the world creates a logic for why compromise is impossible. Um, so to my, that's how I would, if I were trying to, to, to blend it in, to say that some of the figures that we're looking at are heightening the stakes of the fight in the 1840s and 1850s in a way that's shifting the politics in a way that will eventually move a somewhat reluctant, but in the end, ultimately a pretty transgressive group of uh, moderate sounding lawyers to do things that have uh, really almost no parallel in, in US history. Uh, so I'm less interested in studying them to say they caused it or their motives. I'm fine with the idea they're dragged into it. I'm interested in what they did with that power at that moment. Interestingly, here's a question that's from Elaine El Youssef that's asking you to look beyond the historical actors. And he says, in your opinion, can we go beyond historical actors and think of the new phase of international abolitionism inaugurated by the American Civil War in structural terms. In other words, how does the approach of global history, in particular the perspective that emphasizes systemic integrations, help us understand better this second international abolitionism? So I guess he's asking about systems as opposed to some of the individual 
actor, historical actors here? Um, so that's a great question. I don't have it, uh, the answers at my fingertips. I remember um, you know, Romy Sanchez, her dissertation in French, having some pieces of this and some other work, including a number of people who had studied at Michigan who had tried to look at what were some of the interconnections um, that might give you some sense of what, how these networks functioned and flowed. I was disappointed that while uh, you know, there's, there's a lot of mention of money and arms, it is unsurprisingly difficult to pin down exactly how much money and which arms. Um, and uh, you know, we get these flashpoints where we see interconnections between Maceo and the Scotland Garnett organization. And we see lots of interconnections and key figures who are brokering between 1840s, 1850s organizations. Um, but it would be, uh, you know, uh, as far as I know, Romy has, has done the most work I can recall at hand, but I'm sure other people, um, you know, can give more uh, insight. But it would be, you know, remarkable, but also archivally incredibly difficult to figure out, you know, if those things even existed at the moment or, you know, how many of those things were destroyed in passing. My friend Brian DeLay is doing a history of international arms trade. And it is not easy to follow in the, uh, the early 19th century for the obvious reason that people uh, you find when it gets seized. Uh, mm -hmm. So there's lots of mentions of how many weapons someone like Guacaria and Santa Cecilia are moving, uh, you know, from the US to Mexico, from Mexico where Santa Cecilia marries Juarez's daughter and becomes very embedded in that regime from Mexico to the as Rafael Rojas and others have talked about from Mexico to Cuba. But how many at what points, I think, uh, is, is not a question I could answer as well as I wish I could have. Mm -hmm. OK. Um, there's another question from the audience. And then I think if Skip or Alejandro has any closing questions, we'll turn back to them. This one is also from Elaine Youssef, who, El Youssef, who also said, thank you very much for this inspiring lecture. Um, and he also asks, I would like to hear from you if you believe it's possible to think of the American Civil War as an event that decisively spread the geoculture of abolitionism throughout not only the Southern United States and Cuba, but also Puerto Rico and Brazil. And by geoculture geo of abolitionism, he means a set of ideas, values, and norms that were widely accepted throughout the world and that restricted social action. That's a great question. Um, for some of the reasons that I mentioned in my answer to Alejandro, my inclination would be to say, no, they expected to, um, but they didn't, both because of, of precedent, uh, that these ideas existed in different forms, uh, you know, uh, as, as we well know. Uh, you know, Cuban anti-slavery has many roots, uh, including those back to the continent and those to the British. So the idea that, so I think, you know, we should resist the idea of, of the novelty. Um, and in Madrid, while the U.S. plays an important role in, in a stage of, uh, of Spanish abolitionism in the late 60s, early 70s, it's in a context where it's been more influenced by France and, and, and England for obvious reasons than the US uh, to that point. So it's a novelty to them to have this kind of engagement with the US and it creates some of these weird juxtapositions of previously pro-slavery people like Sickles suddenly being champions of, uh, you know, held up as, as champions. So for that reason, you know, that when we think of the, the multiplicity, when we think of the long chronology that's come up, I would have my doubts, um, but I am also thinking of uh, Roberto Saba's work in, in Brazil, where he talks about how important the business interest is a conduit to the movement of culture, not the precedent. Uh, Brazilian abolitionists didn't need, you know, the U.S. Civil War to think about abolitionism, but the forms they received it in the flood of northern business interests that tied their interconnection to a kind of culture of anti-slavery um, does have some impact. So it's a... Um, challenging question for me to work out. And he also asked about Puerto Rico, which is uh, something I'm highly interested in on a personal level uh, because of uh, family connections, but I have no, but, I, but my sense of Puerto Rican abolitionism is that in the 1860s, it's large, but it's primarily oriented toward European and continental and Spanish countries abolitionism um, and only becoming more engaged with the US. So I, again, would resist uh, as a as an amateur in this, I would resist the the sort of uh, centrality of the U.S. So, it's a flashpoint, but I think um, 
the, again, the gap is that they expected it to change the world. Um, and it, I'm not sure it did. And that's a really uh, challenging question for US historians to figure out. Um, Thank you. I'm going to turn it back, I think, to Skip and Alejandro if they want to have any final questions and um, thank you for answering these and and, and so well, thank you so much for all your help thank you Alejandro a final word before I wave goodbye to everyone very quickly to say that it's interesting how this uh, kind of historiographic move uh, in your case Greg from the US looking south is also happening the other way around both Sam Payne and Alain El Joseph are Alari related as uh, scholars. Uh, Alain was, uh, is, he's a mammal and alum, uh, Skip. He was in the Mark Glasser Mammal Workshop a few years ago. I think actually Marial commented on his uh, dissertation chapter. So these are scholars who are looking at, at, they're looking at the US Civil War and Reconstruction, but they're doing so from Cuba and from Brazil. Uh, so it's, so you're part of that, uh, kind of uh, transnational group. And the other thing I'll, I'll quickly say is that I think Roquinaldo Ferreira is with us today and his forthcoming book on the illegal slave trade in the 19th century is a must read. So I wanted to just plug that book in um, for uh, all of you to know. Thank you oh, for your excited. wonderful presentation. Very uh, excited by his prior work. So I can't wait to read the, uh, the forthcoming book. Thank you. Me, me too. Um, one of the things that your talk underscored was in a sense how small the world was and how interconnected uh, even in the, uh, a, well, Britain Hammond is the 18th century, but particularly in the 19th century, but then how segmented it, it became because of academic disciplines, uh, limitations of linguistic training and linguistic uh, facility and narrow definitions of what um, one's proper area of inquiry should be and from a PhD dissertation through scholarship that one would uh, put forward for tenure. Meaning, are you an Americanist, Gregory? Um, what's Cuba have to do with this? This strange language, you know, you know what I mean? Nice. And now what we're doing, and I'm, I take great pride in this, being part of this at Harvard, we're, we're not the only place, but through the department and in uh, the Hutchins Center, and there's no clear example than Alejandro's presence right here. You know, we're saying, no, you cannot study these uh, historical periods anymore in isolation. Now, obviously, we're not the first people to do that, but it's very important when Harvard says, says that for reasons that we, we understand. So we're becoming more and more comparative, and that um, the comparative nature of uh, intellectual inquiry mimics the comparative and interconnected nature of the actual historical experience, That's right. which we then fragmented, isolated, and now we're trying to piece it together. Yeah. Uh, and that's a, a curious phenomenon. And uh, the lecture you gave today and your work and the work of Alejandro, Mary Allen, so many other people that you, you quoted, um, augurs a new and exciting day uh, for quote unquote American history, uh, a misnomer, unless it's the history of the Americas, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Greg, as you know, I love your work and you have no uh, bigger fan than uh, I, I'm in the secret reconstruction, secret society with you. <laughs> I'm, I'm the newest member, but, <laughs> but thank you for delivering this lecture. It was so exciting and um, people stayed on until so almost nine minutes till six out here and it's dark. You got um, your food waiting for you. Yeah, no, I have my cocktail waiting for no, <laughs> <I should. laughs> You have to get your priorities right. That's but, right. But thank you. And um, you, it's a brilliant lecture. Just, I could listen to you um, all day long. So have a good evening. Congratulations. A plus, superb job, my brother. <laughs> Hey, thank you so much. I really appreciate all of your help and all of y'all having me and all the audience. So uh, thank you so much. Thanks. Good night, everyone. Thank we'll you. see you soon. Bye. Happy Thanksgiving. Happy Thanksgiving. And stay safe. COVID is a monster and it's, it's back. It's raging, roaring. So stay safe. God bless. Mm -hmm.